Hi everyone. Oh, this is loud. Good morning. How is everybody doing? Great. Great. Every, everybody kind of relaxed after yesterday? Not too tired? Um, well, let's see. So let's see where we can take this containers, operators, all the Docker stuff. Um, so I'm Philip. Um, I work for Elastic. We do kind of software products. You probably have seen or used one of those. Um, if you've ever heard Elk stack or used it, that's from us. Um, these are some of our products. We have some more. Um, but this is not really what this is about. Um, this is more about like how to run stuff on containers and why. So generally, who uses containers? I would assume pretty much everybody by now, right? The question is, who uses containers in production? Okay, that's also a good number. And then the question often is like, who is running data stores or anything stateful on containers? Yeah, that's only two or three. Um, interesting. Um, and we can get to why and why this is good or bad or what are the specific problems around that. Um, is anybody using our images out of interest? One, two, three, a couple, okay. I, I assume mostly in development. Um, okay, so what I want to cover in general is Docker images, it's a bit like things to do with Docker or not to do with Docker, and we can discuss and disagree or agree on those. Um, then quickly looking at Docker Compose, how to run stuff with that. Uh, we'll use, look at Helm charts and Kubernetes operators. Just as a quick raise of hands, Docker Compose, who is using Docker Compose? Who is using Helm charts already? Who is using an operator? Okay, um, so getting less and less and less. Uh, but yeah, let's see where we can take this. So when we talk about containers, I assume most of you mean Docker, right? Um, and probably the right logo for Docker would have been this one. Um, and this is, by the way, the size of most of your Docker images as well. Um, or at least it's for us as well, like admittedly. But size of images is always a complicated point. Um, one other thing that we have at Elastic is that um, once on Slack, somebody said, Docker is actually the world's most heavily funded college project um, because of stability issues and breaking changes, especially in the past. Like Things have improved a bit over time, but at times we were also not that happy with what Docker was doing. Um, on the other hand, there is no real way around containers. So for us, um, containers are probably the new zip format. It's like the one format that everybody has to use and wants to use. Um, but it's only one of many, really. Because we have all these other um, options, like these are some of the ways to get our binaries, and this is are some ways to install them already. And I guess everybody has been using those and has been happy. Um, but lots of people want containers. Do we care if you run our stuff on containers or not? No, we don't care. It's up to you. Like, we don't have any strong preference. Like, if you think containers are the right thing to run your workloads, that's fine. We'll provide those. If you think, like, a tar GZ or a dev package is what you want, and you want to run that on bare metal without any containers, that's also fine. We don't really care. This is something you will need to pick. We will give you the option, but containers are just one of many options. Um, and they are not without issues. So first, I want to dive into some things you should or shouldn't do with containers. Um, the first thing is, and this sounds kind of silly, or at least sometimes, um, that you shouldn't run stuff as root, and you should set up proper permissions. But with containers, this is not that easy, actually, or sometimes confusing. Does anybody know what happens if you try to run Elasticsearch as root? Has anybody tried that? Yes, it quits. That's correct. Um, so we have, by now, we have a check. So basically, we, we check through the low-level system. So JNA is the Java native access is how we check that. Um, we check, do you run Elasticsearch as root on, on Linux? And if you do, we do a system exit. And there is no way around that. If you would want to change that, you would need to fork the code and comment out the system exit. There is no way to run Elasticsearch as root. We don't do that on Windows because Windows is different and complicated. Um, but on Linux, uh, we will not run as root. And this was generally accepted that this is a good practice. But now with Docker, 
stuff started to change again. So um, I think this is the best comic for this. Um, you just have to replace the snake with a whale. And this is what many people do with Docker. Like, bless you. Um, nowadays, um, suddenly you don't care about permissions anymore. You run everything as root. Um, you give everything 777 permissions. Um, because people say, like, containers. And I think we were past this point already. Um, I call this the, yeah, take the picture. <laughs> Um, I call this one of the cockroaches. The, the idea is things that we kind of like got rid of, but they keep reappearing like cockroaches. The idea was that running a server process as root is a bad idea. Don't do it. But with Docker, we met a couple of people who were like, no, we run everything as root in the container because it's in the container. We don't care. And we were like, no, this is still a bad idea. Don't do this. And we still don't support this. And you can open a GitHub issue and say, like, I want to run it as root. And we will close the issue and say, no. Um, sorry. The other thing that we do is or enforce that we have a specific user and group ID, which is 1,000 for Elasticsearch. Um, and it's documented. But what we see every now and then is that people open a GitHub issue. And what they will then comment on is that, I want a simple fire and forget Docker container, which we think is a really weird approach for your data, because this is not fire and forget for your data. You want to care of how you run that. And if you say like fire and forget, the way I always imagine that you run your services is something like this. So this is probably what people are doing with their containers. It's like, we don't care. We just want to run it. Um, so something we don't do is, um, so you keep the data from your data store probably on a bind mounted folder, so on the host. And we don't mutate the permissions on the host. So you will need to set that up correctly. Unless you start up the container, then it will do that for you. But if you kind of change permissions or move stuff around, you will need to ensure that the permissions are being set up correctly. We don't, so our container doesn't change permissions on the host. Because we think it's a really bad practice to mutate anything on the host from within the container. Um, so we don't do that. Um, and then we often run into this kind of like knowledge problem that people were told, you use Docker. Docker is nice. It abstracts everything away. You don't need to know anything about Linux anymore, which is not true because you still need to know, stu know stuff like file permissions. And one thing that is quoted internally quite a bit is those who don't know or don't understand Unix are condemned to reinvent it poorly. And this is kind of what we see with containers every now and then, that people don't really understand what they are doing, but they think, well, containers, everything is wrapped away. I don't need to know anything anymore. And that will lead to problems in the long run. Um, Unix is coming back to you. There is no way around it, unfortunately, or fortunately for those knowing it. Um, one other thing that we see kind of frequently, or let's ask this differently, who is using latest for external dependencies? One, two, three. OK. Um, does anybody know, do we have latest on our containers? No, we don't. Um, and we strongly believe in that. Um, I call this one, one the zombies. Um, ideas that should have been killed by evidence, but they kind of are around. So when in most programming languages, when you define dependencies, um, for example, in Java, when you use Maven or Gradle, or in many other programming languages in the dependency management system, you cannot just say, I want a dependency in latest. You maybe can say, I want a range, like give me this major version or give me this range of versions, but you cannot just say, give me whatever is latest. Because it turned out over time, this is brittle and it's not a good idea overall. And come containers, suddenly everybody is using latest again. And one of the problems there is, for example, Docker Hub. For example, if you go to Docker Hub, and this is from a screenshot from the Elasticsearch Docker Hub image, um, the recommended way to pull this, like you can just copy this one here, is Docker pull Elasticsearch. Since we don't have latest, what will happen here? It will just fail because you need to specify the version. And unfortunately, on Docker Hub, there is no way to add a version number here. We would love to add a version number here, but this is not possible um, right now. Um, 
and I think people open an issue once a month and say like, we copied your command and it doesn't work. And we're always like, yes, we know, but this is not supposed to happen like that. You need to specify the version number. Why is it so important that you specify the version number, especially for stateful stuff? Is let's assume we spin up a cluster with three nodes today. So we have our three nodes. And then, so let's say we have 7.4, which is the latest version, and we have our three nodes here. And then in half a year or so, you want to add two more nodes because you need more capacity. And then you add these two more nodes. If you use latest, here you got 7.4. Here you will get, I don't know whatever is the latest version. It might be a new major version. And it might break your cluster in an unexpected way. That's why we don't do that. You need to specify and what version you want, and it's a bit more work up front, but it will protect you from breaking your cluster in an unexpected way in the long run. And we don't want to have this pain later on. So yes, it's more work today, but it will save you later on. Um, then sometimes people say, okay, what about version ranges? So you specify just seven, the major version, or 7.3, the minor version. Do we support those? Does anybody know? No, we don't have those. Why? Because Elasticsearch, the way it stores data is sometimes a bit picky. If something in the base library, Lucene, that we use for storing changes, um, and you create data on a newer version, it doesn't want to migrate the data to an older node. And then sometimes you would have a cluster that is unbalanced because things were written di with different versions and couldn't move freely between those. So that's why we don't support it and we don't have any intentions of adding those either. So it's only exact version numbers that will be working. Um, another thing that we see kind of frequently is that people want to have some runtime mutation. Does anybody do that? Like you start up the container and you install more plugins or do stuff like that? Because we also think this is a pretty bad idea. So if you start three containers and on two you manage to install a plugin and on the third one you have a network issue, for example, and you don't manage to install the plugin and you will still start them up and join a cluster, you might corrupt your data in an unexpected way again because you have different plugins there. That's why we don't do stuff like this. So sometimes people say like, oh, I just want to provide a run random shell script and then you run the random shell script. Or you have an environment variable and it will pick up plugins and install them through that. And this mutation at startup is something we don't do. What do you do instead? Well, you have a custom Docker file and you just build the image, you push the image, and then you use your own image. And that's how it's supposed to be. Like, don't do runtime mutation. Um, so what we would do, for example, is you pull down whatever version you have from Elasticsearch, you install one plugin, you install another plugin, and this is how you do it. And then you have your custom image and you push it and you're done. And you don't need this runtime mutation. It will just make your life harder in the long run. So don't do that. Um, something we, we have as well as like TLS certificates and key stores to store secrets. Where do you put those? Where would you put your certificates or key stores? Do you bake them into the image? No. Why not? Because they probably have a different life cycle than the rest. Because if your TLS certificate expires, you want to replace just the certificate, but you don't need to change the underlying container because the image version might only change later on, or you might only upgrade later on. Or you might want to rotate some passwords in the key store independent of your image. So you don't want to bake those in. So those would probably be bind mounted. And just in a, as an example, here I'm, I'm on the command line, I'm running, I'm starting up an Elasticsearch node, I'm adding a configuration, and I'm saying like, hey, this is the version I want to run, and I want to SSH into that box, I create the key store, which is then put into this folder. Here my key store is being added and I can reference that later on. So this is how you would generate the key store just with a container and afterwards you would use it in a bind mounted way. But you would not bake that into the image, but you would bind mount it to the image. And then you can, this is Docker Compose, but this is how you could add a secret. But Kubernetes, and most of the other orchestration systems have a way to securely add key stores or secrets. So this is the proper way to do that. Those you don't need to bake into the image. Um, another thing that we often see for discussion is um, base images. 
Who has strong opinions about base images? One, two, three. What are the criteria for your base images? Size? Dependencies? Okay. Um, anything else? Security? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, we also see that. What are the base images everybody is using? Who is using Alpine based images? Who is using like Debian, Ubuntu? Anybody using Red Hat, CentOS, something like that? Okay. Anybody knows what our base images are? Uh, we're using CentOS um, for multiple reasons. The first one is we have a lot of customers in the US and their CentOS or Red Hat is very common and they often want those, whereas Europe is so often more a bit on the Debian Ubuntu side. Um, but yeah, we, we are leaning more towards CentOS. The other thing is since Elasticsearch is Java, our trust in Red Hat with Java stuff is much bigger than in Debian and Ubuntu because Red Hat has a lot of JDK engineers and they have working, been working in that environment for a long time, so they know what they're doing. Um, whereas Debian or Ubuntu has been adding weird bugs over time as well. And we're a bit more skeptical of those images. Um, by the way, we tried Alpine images, but yeah, MuCL might be nice and new and small, but we ran into much more bugs than with glibc. glibc might be old and ugly, but it's very battle tested. Like, we just saw more and more bugs with MuCL over time. So that's why we went with CentOS. Um, the other thing is we have similar images for all of our Docker containers, and they can also share the base layer. So even if CentOS is much larger, since we have multiple images, the same all share the same layer, so it's actually not that bad in terms of size. And the other thing is, as soon as you need the JVM on your containers, your container is not going to be very small anyway, because the JDK is pretty large. Um, and like I said, glibc is much better tested. Um, the downside of that is the size. Who is very concerned about the size of your image? A few, okay. In general, or also for stateful stuff? Because our line of thinking is a bit like, if you put 100 gigabytes of data on in, or store 100 gigabytes of data, why do you care about 200 megabytes in your container size? Like those 200 megabytes are not going to be a major influence. And also, since this is a stateful thing, and we only release like every couple of weeks, like this is not something you will be deploying like 10 times a day. Like for your stateless applications that you develop yourself and that you push constantly, I can see that argument that it changes rapidly and then the network is a pain and you need to wait longer, so you don't want to have that. But you probably don't update your Elasticsearch instances on a daily basis because we only bring out updates every couple of weeks. Um, so why do you care so much about the size? Maybe because in your development machine you're running out of space, but for us that's a bit of an outlier. We care more for production systems, and there we just don't think that the size is that important. It's more about like having stable images um, rather than having the smallest. Um, so for stateful stuff, at least in our opinion, the size is less important. Um, for stateless stuff that you deploy very frequently, there I can see the argument of the size much stronger. So this is where we're headed there. Um, in the future, we might have multiple base images because people have been requesting those. Um, is anybody looking for Windows base images? No? Yeah, that's what I commonly see. Um, only sometimes, like sometimes Windows shops are very strong on that one because I think if you use a current Windows version um, and you use a Windows container, then you can skip that small VM layer they have in between. So it might be slightly more efficient. On the other hand, on our team, nobody knows Windows well enough that we would want to maintain that. Or we try to avoid that a bit. So nobody really wants to get into Windows. Um, okay, Docker Compose. Who is using Docker Compose? Quite a few. Who is using it for stuff or non demo or development stuff. Is anybody using it for anything else? One. Are you using it in production? No, okay. Um, that, that's what we would expect. Um, so 
Yes, it's great for development and demos, um, and it's very lightweight, so this is what I can run easily on my laptop, um, but it's not something you would want to bring into production. So, yeah, those running, wanting to run, for example, Elasticsearch and Kibana quickly, this would be the minimal example of you give the container one gigabyte of memory and set the heap to half a gig, and then you just run whatever is the current version of Elasticsearch and Kibana, and you're good. So this is very convenient just to run the service on your local machine for a demo. It's not what you want to do in production, though. Um, we also have like something we call the stack docker, which is kind of an example of everything with Docker Compose. Um, but we're currently discussing like who wants to maintain it in the future because it's just for demos. And for production, you probably want to use something else. So for production, I guess everybody is gravitating towards Kubernetes, right? Or let's quickly check. Who already uses Kubernetes? Who uses Swarm? Anybody still on Swarm? One? No, 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 it's not a shame. Like, I, I, I see you look very unhappy, but um, do, are you planning to migrate away or are you happy with Swarm? Happy? Okay. Um, uh, is anybody using Nomad from HashiCorp? Okay. How is that going? I'm just curious. It's okay? Okay. Um, anybody using Mesosphere? Mesos? No? Okay. Um, which is probably a good thing because the company behind it um, is doing Kubernetes now as well. I mean, Mesos is an Apache project, so it will be around forever, I guess. But even the company behind it has kind of moved on. Um, so this is what we generally see. Um, what you generally get with Kubernetes then is you have a static configuration to deploy your resources and I assume everybody has seen this too many times already, um, that however you pronounce it, kubectl, kubectl, whatever, um, that's another discussion. Um, that you use that to interact with the API server, um, you store your state in etcd, and then you have your controller manager to uh, talk to your API server, and then you have the kubelets on your Kubernetes nodes, which actually do the work. Uh, that's the general architecture that I'm assume everybody has seen quite a few times in the past. And what you get with that is YAML. And actually lots of YAML. Who likes YAML? I think you had a talk about YAML yesterday, right? Um, by the way, those raising their hand, I always assume this is the Stockholm Syndrome, that you got so used to writing so much YAML that you start liking it at some point. Um, because YAML has its own problems. Um, does anybody know, if you run this through a linter, what will happen? Like, let's assume we use Docker Compose and we want to bind the ports. Um, does this look okay? Anybody knows what will go wrong here? Base yeah, base 60 is the problem. So if you run this through a linter, um, you will get to this result, which is a bit unexpected because Port 80 is being mapped to port 80, that's fine. But the normal mapping is turned into this weird number because that weird syntax where you have number, colon, number, and the first one is lower than 60 is being mapped to base 60, and this is how you get to this number. So what you need to do is you need to quote it so that it's actually a string and it's not being used as a non-base 10 number, basically, and exp uh, happens in a weird way here. Um, so this is one of the joys of YAML amongst many others, but let's skip over YAML. Um, it's what we have. Um, the thing that was a problem for us for a long time, or a long time, some time, because Kubernetes 1.8 has been out for a while, is that you could not use dots in environment variables for a long time. And the way we configure lots of stuff is through dots in environment variables. So. Before 1.8, you couldn't really use our images with Kubernetes, but since then, it's generally possible. Um, and then to roll that out, people often want to use Helm charts. Um, those who have never touched on Helm, um, the, it's the advanced package management. Um, so basically, you have templating and you can define resources. One of the nice things is that it builds on the primitives of Kubernetes. So it's kind of only a package manager. Um, but you still have the same concepts that you have in pure Kubernetes. It's just 
templating or abstracting away some boilerplate stuff, basically. And we do have some Helm charts, um, which do support a couple of services. And while they're on GitHub, they're open source. You can just look at them and go wild. And funnily enough, we have Helm charts and we have an operator. And they are maintained by two different teams. And they have kind of different approaches as well. Um, people are sometimes confused. Why would you do both? But for us, like, there are some differences to which we'll get. But it's also nice to have like different teams working on that and have some competition and different approaches embedded into them. So we are going to keep that. Um, so where do we keep the data? Because that's one of the most common questions. We use a stateful set. Um, by default, we have, if you do an upgrade, we do a rolling upgrade. So basically, you have a three-node cluster, for example. And you will take one node out, upgrade it, wait until it joins the cluster again, and then you will go to the second node. And with the stateful set, your data stays there. You just rotate out the images. Um, and it's doing one at a time until it is back in the cluster and working. Um, we generally test this on Google only, but it should work elsewhere. We have examples for Minikube, et cetera. Um, you can also use uh, local persistent volumes um, in more recent Kubernetes versions, and this is just working, hopefully. Um, the thing about the Helm chart is we always call it unopinionated. So what you do is um, you have the regular Docker way. You have like environment variables, and you bind mount your certificates, and you bind mount your uh, key stores. And there are multiple upgrade strategies and everything. So here, we don't have like best practices or anything baked in. It's just basically some templating how to set up a cluster or upgrade it from one state to the other. But we don't have like too much opinions baked into that. It's more like this is one way to do it. And the nice thing about that is that with Helm, you just have kind of like the installation or upgrade path. And otherwise, it doesn't mess with your cluster. And also, you can do it multiple ways. So if you have lots of things you want to manage, Helm charts are nice because you can customize them a bit more to how your workflow works or how you expect stuff to work. Whereas the operator that we have is very opinionated. So it does things in a certain way. And you don't have much choice around that, which has advantages and disadvantages. Um, just to give you a quick Minikube example, um, you can get from helmelastic.co, bless you, um, is where we keep the Helm charts. Um, you would, by default, as soon as we have a release, it would use the latest version. You could set a version explicitly where you set image in that version. Um, for Minikube, you would need to have these two add-ons. And then you could just uh, use the Minikube example. And as you can tell, this is a bit unopinionated, like we're using make. Who likes make? Boo, ah, yeah. Um, this depends a bit on where you're coming from. I think the, the old timers like Make because it has been very stable and around forever. Um, to make it easier, you can see what Make is doing. You can just use that one. Um, you don't have to deal with too much YAML or anything. Um, make will make your life a bit easier. And just to give you a quick idea of what this might look like, um, so you will want to set, if you run this on Minikube, you will want to set the affinity to soft so it doesn't enforce that different nodes are on different physical machines. Um, you could set, for example, the heap. You can set up some limits around CPU and memory. And you could set your storage here. So here is just 100 megabyte, but for a demo, that would be enough. Um, and that's all there is to the Helm charts, basically. And this is how you can run them. Um, and then we're getting into the operator. Um, so the operator, um, the idea is you're extending the Kubernetes interface now. And you can customize it. And you actually manage an application and not just Kubernetes resources. So um, basically, you have custom resource definitions. And the way to think about this, or the abstraction level, is like rather than in Helm and Kubernetes, you're thinking about pods and services and secrets, like in Kubernetes concepts. Whereas with the operator, you're thinking in, like for us, in Elastic terms, like you have Elasticsearch and Kibana and APM. Like those are the services that we support here. So you kind of have higher level services and abstractions, and you don't need to think in the Kubernetes terms anymore. That's kind of the, the change in thinking. Um, and how you actually bring that to life is with custom controllers. So you have a custom controller that uh, 
that takes this custom resource definition, and basically it's a reconciliation loop. What this does is you have some configuration, and the reconciliation loop is checking like, okay, this is what you have right now, this is what you have configured what you want, is it the same? If not, I will make some changes. And this will continuously loop. And this reconciliation loop or life cycle is also what is a big difference to Helm. Helm basically runs once, and moves you from this state to that state. It's like a package manager. It installs something or it upgrades something or it adds capacity, for example. But once it is finished, it's done. Whereas the operator will continuously check, is this in the state that you have configured and wanted? If not, I will change it. So for example, if one of your Elasticsearch nodes dies and the operator sees like, oh, you have configured three nodes, but you only have two running, it will automatically add a third node again and bring your cluster into the desired state. So kind of like this lifecycle management is what the operator does in the background. So it continuously keeps your cluster in the state that you configured, whereas Helm is just moving you from one state to the next. But what's happening in between is pretty much up to you. Um, and the other thing is here, this one is opinionated. So for upgrades or how we keep secrets or how we generate certificates, this is all built in. With Helm charts, you will need to generate your certificates yourself, and you can then mount them or reference them. Um, whereas with the operator, we'll generate certificates for you. And it's just like how we think best practices work and how stuff should be wired together. And that's how we do that. And you don't have to think so much about it, but we will do it automatically for you. So there was one pretty common operator by I forgot his name, but Pires, or probably that is his name, Pires. Um, he had an operator, and he had been maintaining that for a, quite a while. Um, but he then kind of stopped it a couple of months ago, or almost a year ago. And we kind of saw a chance and when we added our own operator. So this is the logo for the operator, and this one is alpha right now. So we have an Elastic operator, and it does support Elasticsearch, Kibana, and the APM server. So all our server components are being covered by the operator. The Helm charts were supporting different services because different teams and different opinions. Um, but this is what we currently do in the operator. What does alpha mean? So we will have the beta kind of soonish, hopefully. Um, but in alpha, basically, you can stand up a cluster, but we don't guarantee that you can easily move forward. So there is not necessarily an upgrade strategy from alpha to beta and then to GA. Once we hit beta, there should be an upgrade strategy from beta to GA and then later versions. Um, but while we're in alpha, which hopefully will end soon, um, don't put your important data in yet, just start experimenting with it. But we do run it quite heavily internally already. So we have quite a few clusters running internally on the operator, even though it's only alpha. So we're trying to test our own stuff there. Um, it's built on Golang 1.13. Um, we're currently switching for the beta. We will be on Cube Builder 2 already. Um, the pull request has been merged, I think, last week. Um, so basically, um, Cube Builder is an SDK for Kubernetes APIs and using custom resource definitions. Um, and this is what kind of like is underpinning our operator. Does anybody want to write operators in something else than Go? Yes, what language? The next ah, <laughs> okay. Um, so I know that some people have strong opinions. Um, like the team that is writing that, they have a, like a Scala background, but they didn't use Java, but they went with Go because it's kind of the de facto standard and we wanted to keep it broad. But I know that some people have strong opinions and want to use other languages to write operators in. If that's a good or bad idea, we can discuss. We went with Go. Um, and this one is generally opinionated. So what we're doing is we encode best practices and we have the operational knowledge. So for example, we know how to do an upgrade. And when we do an upgrade, we just to make sure that your data is not being impacted, we will try to vacate a node and move stuff, or when we, especially when we downscale, um, we will vacate a node. So basically we will move our data away from it and only then remove the node. For upgrades we don't do that, but for downscaling, for example, we have a strategy how to move data away and only remove a node then. Um, or for security, we have like specific setups. And this is like how we think stuff should be configured. 
and it's just built in. So this one is opinionated. Um, one is, for example, yeah, like I said, scaling down, we will drain a node first, so we'll take all the data out of a node and only then move or kill the node. For upgrades, for example, we disable shard allocation so data does not unnecessarily move around and only then do the upgrades. But this doesn't mean you cannot shoot yourself in the foot. So if you have like a weird configuration of Elasticsearch, you can still make your data unavailable for some time. So for example, if you have zero replicas, so basically you have one single copy of your data and you do an upgrade and the node that has that one single copy of your data is being upgraded, your data will not be available for however long it takes until that node comes back up. So it's not guaranteed to work. It's like you still need to know like how are we doing upgrades and what are you configuring to make sure it works in combination. Um, just saying that, like, you can still hurt yourself a bit. Um, running that on Minikube is also kind of simple. Um, why I'm not demoing that on my laptop is because this is how much memory I have. Um, like, this is what, what works. It might work with a bit less, but not too little. Um, and then you can start this one and how to get our operator. So right now we're at 090, which is an alpha. There will be 010 which will be a better already. And then probably, I'm not sure if we will have a 0 011 or if we'll go to 1 at some point. Uh, but there will be a 0 010 at least. Um, and right now we have an all-in-one, but th this will also change for the operator. Basically, this is how you get the operator. So this is where you download it from. Um, then you can monitor it coming up, and then you can just deploy your configuration. And this is how you configure APM Elasticsearch and Kibana. And I'll just show you in three slides next three slides or this one file, um, how you would configure that. So here, for example, you can see this is the Elasticsearch operator, and you can see it's an alpha. I'm just always pointing it out. It's still alpha that it will change, but right now it's an alpha. Um, I can say this is the version I want to run. I want to run a single node. This is Elasticsearch with these resource limits. Um, this is the resource claim for the volume, and we give it two gigabytes of data. So this is basically how you wire that together. And then you can run um, APM. APM and Kibana are for us stateless. So those are a bit simpler to configure. You don't need to have any volume claims or anything. You just say like, this is the version, this is the node count, here you reference Elasticsearch, and then you're done. Um, this one is also alpha, like the API version. This is just our custom namespace there for that. Um, and Kibana looks pretty much exactly the same. Those two are stateless, whereas Elasticsearch is stateful. There you need to work with um, uh, the, the right configuration for your data. Um, and then you can just um, check the status for those services. You could expose Kibana on its default port and we set up credentials for you automatically. This is how you could get the password that we set up for the Elastic user, for example, here. Um, so to extract those, sec security will be managed for you. If you want to make any changes, like change the size, the number, um, you just change it in your file, you run a kubectl, and you're done, and it will just apply your changes over time. How this generally looks like is, so you have your operator, and this is the operator that we have running. Then you have your configuration where you say, this is how I want my cluster to look like right now. And then you basically, the operator will fetch that configuration that you have configured and make sure this is what you have actually configured right now. And if those two don't match, in the reconciliation loop, the operator will take this state and bring your cluster into whatever state you have configured over there. So this is the general idea of the operator, that within the reconciliation loop, you will always bring your cluster to whatever version you have or whatever setup you have configured right now. Um, this is pretty widely supported on various platforms. Um, and we're currently, like the beta will be based on stateful sets. Right now we're not on stateful sets yet. We kind of wrote our own backend for that, but then we figured out that we are reinventing stateful sets. So that's why we're moving over to those. Um, so for example, to do an, an upgrade, we'll just use volumes and just reuse them. So basically they will be attached to, the, to a pod, then we will upgrade the pod and reattach the volume to that one. Um, so this is pretty much the standard way of running upgrades and doing stuff with stateful sets. Um, for storage, um, persistent volumes will be the default. 
like local or whatever your cloud vendor provides. Um, you could also run MTDR or host path. Is anybody running workloads this way? So the, the thing with those is it's not guaranteed that your data is there, but sometimes it's very quick to restore your data because you have very little data. And you basically just care that your data is quickly accessible, but it doesn't need to be persistent. This will not be a very common setup, but we do support that as well. Um, what um, MTDR doesn't have quotas, so it might be evicted at some point. That's kind of the main downside to that. So persistent volumes will be what most people want to use, also because you want to keep your data in a persistent fashion. Um, in the future, we might bring in our own backend implementation. So if you are not on a cloud provider, and you don't have any nice way to have network attached storage, we might want to bring some more generic concept into our operator, but we're not sure about that yet. And we might support stuff like OpenEBS in the future. Like OpenEBS already has a blog post of how to use our operator with their storage backend. I assume this is working. I haven't verified that yet. We might officially support that or not in the future, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's kind of on our radar. Um, Something that's kind of interesting is deployment model-wise, you will need admin level permissions to add uh, custom resource definitions. And what Elasticsearch right now is doing on the host, we are setting, this is one of the very few settings that you need to apply on the host level um, to be applied to your container. Which is generally maybe not a best practice because you, don't sh you should not change anything on the host. So we will probably get rid of this in the future, and then you will need to set this up correctly before running the operator. Right now, they're kind of leaning a bit more on the, like, let's make it easier to get started and change something on the host, but it's not a good idea, and we'll probably get rid of that. Um, so to run the operator, you generally have two modes how to run an operator. You could run it in a global namespace. So basically, we have a system namespace, uh, Elastic System, where the operator runs, and then all your clusters depend on this namespace. This has the advantage that if you're in one of these namespaces here, you cannot accidentally remove any resources from the operator because it has its own namespace. Um, it also needs to run the operator only once. It kind of has the downside that you need more permissions to install it globally here. And the other thing is that it might be a bottleneck if you run many clusters and they all depend on the same operator. The alternative to that one would be that you have a single namespace. So basically, you run the operator multiple times, and basically, you run the operator once for every cluster or every namespace that you're running. So you have a dev team and an app team or whatever, different applications, and they would all run their own operator in maybe different versions um, to set up the cluster. This is the alternative. Um, but this will also make stuff like you want to have cross-cluster communication, uh, for example, harder. There you might want a global operator again. Or we want to have a mixed mode. We'll, we're not sure about that yet. Other operators, like there are many operators out there. Operator Hub is the kind of the marketplace in common. If you go there, you will see there are quite a few. Um, I've recently heard that ours is actually getting pretty popular. Um, I think this is run by Red Hat and they shared some numbers with us. Um, so to wrap up, um, containers are disrupting the industry. This is one of the quotes we, we've heard quite a few times internally, and we're never sure if that's in, said in a positive or in a negative way. Because if you run Elasticsearch in a bad way on containers, it will disrupt your cluster, but not in a good way. Um, so yeah. Often people ask, like, can I run Elasticsearch on Docker or Kubernetes? And we're like, yes, you can, but that's the wrong question. The question you should be asking is, should I do that? And what is the answer to should you do that? Maybe, yes. And uh, normally, if you're a consultant, uh, you would say it depends, and then you charge a lot of money afterwards. Um, but it really depends. Like, if you don't know much about Docker or Kubernetes, I wouldn't start with that. If you run everything like that, then why not? And we try to support you and provide the tooling for that. Um, but we are not really opinionated about that. Like, we don't care if you run something on Docker or Kubernetes or not. Um, and we'll be keeping the Helm charts and the operators, at least for now, because the Helm chart is like the more generic, unopinionated approach. And the operator is more the opinionated approach where most more of the best practices are encoded in it already. But it's also being run in a very specific way then. So it's kind of like, 
our approach how to run this. And I think both have merit, so that's why we are about to keep both for now, and they are being maintained by different teams as well. So, I think we have one minute left. Any questions? Yes, yes, there are questions. There are questions, thank you. Okay, let's, uh, let's go with the first one. Uh, why is it uh, bad practice to use Docker Compose in production? Uh, the question is on ah, the screen. Okay. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't say it's like maybe bad practice is maybe too strong, but it's just not very common, especially if you want to run stuff not on a single host. And as soon as you have like a data store, you probably don't want to, to run everything on a single host because it will end up as your single point of failure. Um, I have not really seen Docker Compose much in production anywhere, to be honest. So, yeah. Question answered. Uh, next one. What do you think about SLES, SUSE? Now a lot of companies move from Red Hat to SLES. Um, I have never used that, so I don't know. Okay, the question I answered. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, uh, there's another one. Uh, what do you think about using Docker? I think it's more or less related to the first one, but okay. What do you think about using Docker Compose file for deployment to Kubernetes? It's different. Compose. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm a bit like, mm, yeah. Uh, it feels like you, you have like an old concept that you want to shoehorn on something new just to reuse the concept. I'm not, I'm not sure that's going to work well, though I've never used... Um, this compose, so I, I don't know. I, I also don't see it that much. Is anybody using that? <laughs> oh, I see <laughs> just a thumbs down. Is anybody using it and likes it? Okay, no. Hmm. So then I guess uh, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Please make some noise. Philip Pran.